Welcome back to the Welsh History Podcast, episode 94, The Prince of Wales. Hey, welcome back to the podcast. I hope you've had a good start to your 2019. Uh, apologies for not being able to publish last week. Unfortunately, just family and everything else around Christmas time just made it very difficult to get the script right and get to an episode the way I wanted to. So I just wanted to apologize briefly for that, but uh, we're back up and running and we'll be going by week every two weeks as always from here on out till the end of Independence, which if current tracking is correct, will be sometime around the end of April. Uh, at which point we'll probably take a little bit of time off just to kind of prepare for the what comes next. So let's get to the episode, shall we? The latter half of 1257 saw Henry forced to intervene in the growing war in Wales. His fear that things would continue to grow was measured against the finances that they were struggling to attain, at, mostly because the king was trying to do two things at once. He was trying to fight a war in Wales and trying to... Uh, gain some measure of control in Sicily, of all places. And the intrigue between himself and his barons, which was only getting worse in this period, for various reasons, which we will certainly go into in this episode, Henry used two arguments to fund his campaign. First, if Llewellyn was allowed to continue, he might overthrow the whole kingdom, a prospect which was lacking in credulity, but... It might have been effective after the failures by his nobles to make any progress in their campaign against him. Second, the prince to this point could, would not heed warnings or come to terms with the king in a manner that Henry would find suitable. Things had gone too far in the eyes of the king, and he needed to be pinned back. Preparations were made throughout the summer of 1257 with the forces of the king uh, aligned to meet at Chester on August 8th of 1257. The king had planned a northern assault through the four cantrips across the Conwy and then moving along the coast into Anglesey, taking the heart of the resistance from Flewellyn. As they deliberated, they eventually divided their forces, some going north as planned and the rest going south to Doithbarth under Richard de Clare, the Earl of Gloucester. According to academics, it was obvious that de Clare was the one behind the division as he wanted the southern lands taken back rather than just dealing with the heart of the threat, again showing that likely Henry was struggling to convince his nobles to get on with his plans. De Clare, on the other hand, or Gloucester as we'll probably call him from here on out, was likely upset over the loss of territory in Glamorgan, including the loss of one of his castles near Cardiff at this point. Around July 13th, Llewellyn had sacked the castle, killing a number of the Earl's men. On July 18th, de Clare met with the king at Woodstock and advocated for the change in plans. He was not in the mood to deal with just a northern threat not when his lands were being pillaged and not when his people were being killed. One thing this does show is that at this point, Llewellyn was effectively ranging farther east and south with impunity and into the marcher lords' territory themselves without much concern about the consequences or the king. Once the threat began to crystallize, Llewellyn must have decided to move to match the problem. In other words, to deal with the issue of these two attacks, he must have seen that he needed to be aware of them and be able to respond to them. Gloucester had effectively forced command of the southern campaign into his own hands, and all the power and money flooded in from Prince Edward lands in Gwent as well as from Ireland, which must have sat well with the temperamental prince. Henry's more pacifist nature seemed to win him over in the last ditch attempt to negotiate with Llewellyn, reaching out futilely and delaying any real reaction for about 17 days after the assembly at Chester. He tried again and again to create bonds of fealty that seemed to Llewellyn to have been proven a waste of time. He had the initiative and was winning. Why should he negotiate with a king who was too feeble to take action on his own? Meanwhile, Gloucester was using his separate army to bring the south back to heel. He had a divide and conquer strategy that worked fairly well against the Welsh over and over again throughout independence offering incentives to those who were former allies to return, as well as using force against those who decided to continue to hold with the prince, and in doing so, of course, whittled down the offensive that had been going on in the south, basically the raiding, the pillaging, the taking of territory, which seemed to have been happening for the most part for the last six months unabated. 
According to the Chronicle of the Princes, the King of England, along with his mighty host, ended up coming to a place called Degonwy, uh, which was a small village on the Conwy. This happened in late August, and it pushed Llewellyn back across the Conwy, as you can imagine. But even then, Henry complained about having to make this move. So even the simplest of aggressions, taking back the four cantrips, which was territory he himself had owned, was annoying, difficult, awkward, he shouldn't have to do it, complain, complain. You know, things that kings don't normally do, nor should do. By the 8th of September, he was actually eyeing for a way to back out of the campaign, not really wanting to enter Gwyneth proper, and failing to move against Anglesey as planned. Rather, the king appeared to look to an excuse rather than resolve. By mid-September, the king retreated even away from Conwy. It was a mistake that would drag out the Welsh independence so much longer than it probably had a right to at this point. The King of England had the resources, but not the resolve, to end the last real independent kingdom, and in so doing, gave them native allies. Griffith at Madog, for example, as we talked about previously, finally came fully into the Llewellyn's camp. However, in the south, it was a disaster for Llewellyn. His staunch ally, Merduth ap Rieskrig, finally gave in to the English and simply demanded the lands he had previously possessed after 1256. It appears, according to some evidence, that Gloucester was able to bring to bear knights from Ireland and constables from Prince Edward to pressure the Welsh and to force them to treat with him. Edward himself took a part of the campaign in the south, encouraging his troops to take and hold Cardigan and Carmarthen, while opening talks with the local Welsh lords to bring them back on side. The method of fist then velvet seemed to work quite well in areas which were already formally been in English possession for about a hundred years by this point. On October 18th, 1257, Meredith did finally do homage to the king, ending the southern war effectively. Meredith won back all the land that Llewellyn had given to Rhys Vaichan, which, as we mentioned, likely put a damper on their allegiance in the first place. The lack of Welsh unity effectively led to their demise once more. The princes were more concerned about their own power locally than power generally. The idea that they would allow one of their own to have all the control seemed foreign enough still. In other words, they were unable to do anything that would give themselves over to a power of native control and allowed themselves to be continually manipulated by the English. Once again, the North-South Divide hurts the Welsh ability to work comprehensively and to win battles against a force that was far greater in number and resources. Meredith would remain a problem for Llewellyn after the autumn of 1257 and into 1258, as the two men conflicted again and again as Llewellyn tried to win back the South in face of Meredith's alliances. In a great irony, even bringing his one-time enemy, Rhys Feichan, into the battle to help him defeat his one-time former ally. This breaking of bonds between the two men likely formed the basis for Llewellyn's dealings with other princes and lords. He demanded proper political alliances, not just simply agreements and peace treaties, but rather actual fealty associated with feudal lordship rather than simply a case of being obligated to come to someone else's aid like an equal you were now being demanded to respect and honor your allegiance to your overlord uh, and this would have driven a lot of the mentality that was going on at this point much more along the lines of english lords and the kings no more would anyone else be recognized as the leader on the level with Llewellyn, and of course that would create problems and divisions of their own, and that would be the kind of thing that he would have to deal with. In the spring of 1258, possibly earlier, in the political roles were formalized. Llewellyn is no more just the Prince of North Wales, the Lord of Snowdon, or even the King of Gwynedd at this point. He is now the Prince of Wales. Documents in March begin to use the title. It's not one that gets used a lot, but no other titles are used after this point. This is not like his grandfather, who the titles had come from the English and he just sort of associated them with himself. This had been a part of the agreement of all the lords of Wales who were under his 
allegiance. The native rulers, whether by force or conviction, had finally acknowledged that Llewellyn was the supreme overlord of Wales. The final key to that puzzle was to convince Henry of this as well. This is where Llewellyn's grandfather had struggled. Obviously, Henry III didn't want to give recognition of someone as the Prince of Wales. Llewellyn, on the other hand, wanted to get the rightful heir this designation and have it be something that was inherited and something that was recognized down through history. But Henry never agreed to it because, of course, it did not suit his purposes to have a single leader in the land. He enjoyed a great deal of control over and wanted to continue to do so. And, of course, one of the ways to do that was to keep the allegiances of the local Welsh kings and princes and lords under his control, not someone else's. So based on that, it seemed unlikely that Llewellyn ap Griffith would be any more successful than his grandfather at getting this concession. In the pursuit of this acknowledgement, Llewellyn met his first foreign lords. The lords of Scotland's influential common family were a party to a treaty which saw the Welsh prince agree to work with the Scottish to protect their mutual interests against the English. This was supposed to be the first step in a greater alliance with the King of Scotland, but the lords themselves had no real authority over Alexander III and could not commit him to anything specific. In fact, at this point, the common family were mostly on the down in Scotland because of the English interference and had struggled to regain control to this stage. Of course, they will become fairly famous for the conflict between them and uh, Robert the Bruce later on. But at this point, they still felt like they had an option and a control over the kingdom. On March 18, 1258, the various lords on both sides signed off on the pledge. It appears that the Welsh had hoped to finally renew their alliance with the Old North, now controlled by the Scots rather than Britons, in the hope of using their common enemy as the root of this unity. Certainly this was the reason why Scotland in later life would maintain a close alliance with France against England until the Tudor period. One can see this as the beginning of Llewellyn finally doing what his uncle had tried to do, which was to create an independent nation, no longer having to rely on the good graces of the mercurial king who created so much division in this country. The prince was finally trying to become his own man, while trying to take the name of Prince of Wales rather than King of Wales, or even the older title, such as King of the Britons. This was likely a way to keep Henry out of it, and to keep it clear that Llewellyn was going to try and keep Wales independent, at least in both name and fact. Yet even there, there was some tiptoeing around some awkward issues, such as Powys Fadog, which maintained its level of independence and expectations that it would remain so in the future, very much like how Wessex and Mercia remained slightly distinct places within the overall English kingdom for a number of years after they united, in quotes. One of the big changes in this period was that David, Llewellyn's younger brother, was now in his camp, one of the first signers of the Scottish Declaration along with his brother. He was also a key man in the military campaigns in the South later in the year. 1258 became the year when Wales was, for the first time since the Norman invasion, united under one leader, for a fact not just in name. The Prince of Wales might not control the marches, but he did lead almost all of the native leaders, and controlled almost all of the remaining lands from Doithbarth to Chester, and he had created unity by feudal right in the ways in which his former ancestors could not. Llewellyn may have benefited by the fact that Henry was having trouble enough at home that his lackluster interest in Wales were remaining firmly on the back burner, which gave Llewellyn the time he needed to deal with his local allegiances. Add to that the uprising of the Irish, as they too briefly united under Brian O'Neill as king of the kings of Ireland, and the English monarchy had its hands full. Over the winter of 1257-58, Professor Morris argues that Edward finally began to bridle at the control wielded by his mother and father in his life. In so doing, he began to prepare to deal with the things on his own, no longer to rely on the advice and controlling interests of his monarchical parents. Meanwhile, the marcher lords themselves increasingly became agitated with Llewellyn and fell more and more into the inner circle of the monarch's advisors. Over the winter months, Edward had prepared for the war in Wales, sending more supplies to Carmarthen. 
he was also desperate for money and men, and because of this, Edward turned to his uncles, who were on the opposite side of the war with his mother's family. This left him isolated from her control, and knowing how much she desired that control must have frustrated her to no end. So she, along with her allies in Parliament, began to agitate against the prince and king and their handling of the Welsh wars. In late April 1258, the allies of the queen and the English barons struck to try and get control from the king and the prince once and for all, to curtail their power and return the queen to her seat of power, at least in her mind. Obviously, her allies had different ideas. Key allies in this were Richard de Clare, the Earl of Gloucester, who we had mentioned earlier, who had won the South Wales battles and had pushed away from the king in the process, Earl Simon de Montfort, Earl of Leicester, who was the troublemaker we had mentioned in a previous episode, and Roger Bygod, Earl of Norfolk. These three powerful earls stood up to the king and prince and made their price that King Henry and Prince Edward must swear to abide their counsel and must put away their associated brothers and uncles. Effectively, this moment was to create the space needed for Llewellyn to finalize his controls, but also left him with no one to treat with, because the English side had basically become a basket case, thus frustrating his ability to push his advantage. From June 11th to the 22nd of 1258, the Oxford Parliament, as it was called, saw the two sides meet, the earls and the king, this time, the earls had the advantage of military might as knights had gathered to support them. The king and the prince were once again forced to work with the earls and to pound out an agreement with them. If the earls hoped to separate Edward from his uncles, they more or less failed miserably as he became seemingly more intertwined with them over the year. And as the earls' demands became thick and fast, it actually created more and more division between them and the heir to the throne. But in the end, Edward would sign off on the scheme the earls brought forward, and by July his uncles were banished from the kingdom. Their lands and castles seized, and the kingdom was once again in the hands of a council of fifteen who truly held the power in the kingdom, and of course all three of the earls we mentioned earlier were members of that council. This continued issue with the English and their internal struggles created issues for Llewellyn, because of course he cannot build the relationship he wants to build, which is one of an independent kingdom, which has a relationship and a recognition from his associate and much larger kingdom of England. Think of it in a modern parlance. When countries are formed, they look to make themselves recognized. They want official recognition from other countries, specifically from the big countries of the world, because knowing that, say, America or China or Russia gives you recognition, it allows you to then say, well, obviously I'm a real country because these big guys have acknowledged it. And when you don't get that, think of places like Taiwan, it, it makes it much more difficult when you're still considered a part of another country, even though you yourself don't consider yourself that. In this case, this is effectively what Wales is dealing with. Llewellyn is trying to create a separate country, a recognizable and recognized separate country. He'll go to the Pope, he'll go to other countries to try and get that recognition. That's part of the reason why, of course, they're reaching out to places like Scotland and part of the reason why he's desperately trying to meet with Henry at this point. Because the reality of it is, is Henry's a weak king. We've seen this. His inability to carry out the war led to why Llewellyn is able to make such great gains. But his own weaknesses come back to haunt him in the face of his own earls. And so you have to deal with that problem. And for Llewellyn, it creates a whole level of problems he wasn't anticipating, or at least may not have been able to deal with, which is to be able to get control of his circumstances and to be able to get the big guy on the block to say, oh yeah, you are an acknowledged country. Obviously, later with Edward, that was never going to happen. Edward was a whole different leader, and he pretty much presumed the island of Britain was his playground. But at this point with Henry III, had that been able to be set up, there may have been a lot of change in how Wales came about later. 
it may have been much more like Scotland where they were able to kind of remain united in the face of external opposition. But they would have only had 30 years to do that, whereas at this point Scotland had had hundreds of years to get used to being a united nation. And even then they still divided up amongst the various lords. They still backbit each other. They still created similar problems that would happen in Wales. In fact, Scotland and Wales have a lot in common in that respect because on both occasions you have strong parties who don't agree, who are fighting over various levels of control in the kingdom and not willing to see the other side. It creates the division that allows Edward to conquer them in the first place. And this will continue to be an issue, obviously, right through the end of Welsh independence, because various leaders will continue to want control, want to take back control from the other. And even as they start to acknowledge that they do have an overlord, you're still going to have this basic problem. In that chaos, Llewellyn Ep Griffith took power in Wales, but was left without a partner to talk to during the summer of 1258. Academics argue whether this hurt Llewellyn in the long run, as while it allowed him to consolidate his power base, it also removed his ability to sign a treaty acknowledging his independence from the crown. It would also delay the ability to get that recognition for the title that he had claimed for himself. Princeps Wale Tuisog Cymru, the Prince of Wales. Thank you for listening. I hope you have a great year. If you have any comments, questions, concerns, you can always reach me at welshhistorypodcast at gmail.com. You can reach me online via Twitter at welshhistorypod. You can also visit us at Facebook at facebook.com forward slash welshhistorypodcast. And for everything we do, you can always check us out at distractionsmedia.com. Until next time, everyone, take care. Have yourselves a great 2019, and I hope you had a great holiday. Later. This has been a Distractions Media production. And for everything we do, check out distractionsmedia.com. I'm Daniel Norcross. And I'm Rory Dollard. And between us, we are England Cricket on 99.94. We'll be every week looking at the ups, the downs, the runners, the riders, the news and the views on all things English cricket. And believe you me, there are plenty of ups and downs. Join us, England Cricket on 99.94.